Everybody welcome. Good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening. Uh, welcome to the launch of the 3D Commission report. Uh, on behalf of the 3D Commission, um, welcome to this um, event. Um, my name is Sandro Galea. I have the privilege of serving as Dean of the Boston University School of Public Health in Boston, United States. But I'm here serving in my capacity as the chair of the Rockefeller Foundation Boston University, University Commission on data determinants and decision making. Today represents the launch of the Commission report, coincident with the 76th gathering of the UN General Assembly. And thank you everybody for joining us. We have a full program this morning, but uh, before uh, we get into the program, I would like to open it up for a few opening remarks. Our first opening remarks are um, uh, coming from Dr. Tedros, who is the Director General of the World Health Organization. Um, Dr. Tedros uh, has a conflict right now, but he has kindly um, taped remarks for us. Dr. Tedros remarks. Dear colleagues and friends, the COVID-19 pandemic is a reminder both of our interconnectedness and of the long-standing structural drivers of health inequities. Real-time data is essential for understanding what makes people healthier or sicker and to shape policy decisions to support countries to progress towards the sustainable development goals. I would like to congratulate the 3D Commission for the impressive contributions they have made in creating a common language between health, determinants, uh, data science, and decision making to give us a three-dimensional view of public health and social justice. WHO is proud to contribute to the report being launched today. And I would like to thank Professor Sandro Gallia and his team from the Boston University School of Public Health for your visionary leadership and the Rockefeller Foundation for supporting this unique work. It's up to us to act on the work of the Commission and use its recommendations to address these underlying health inequities so that people everywhere can benefit from better health decisions as we work together towards universal health coverage. Congratulations, and I thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chetros, for those um, kind, welcoming remarks. I'm now going to turn it over to Dr. Naveen Rao. Dr. Rao is a senior vice president of the Health Initiative at the Rockefeller Foundation, and really the intellectual architect of this work, Dr. Rao. You're on mute, Naveen. Sorry about that. Um, good morning. Thank you, Dr. Galea, for the introduction, and thank you to the 3D Commission for inviting me to speak at today's event. I'd like to start by congratulating the Commission on the launch of your report, which charts a clear path forward on connecting data, social determinants, and decision-making to improve health for all. The Rockefeller Foundation has always been a strong supporter of the Commission, as your work reflects our own commitment to use data to improve health outcomes around the world. This commitment has come to the forefront during the COVID-19 emergency, where we witnessed firsthand the difference accurate data can make in responding to a threat and protecting people's health. At the beginning of the crisis, data was siloed, 
hard to find or just unavailable. That's why our program team worked tirelessly with organizations like the COVID Tracking Project, for instance, to aggregate US COVID-19 data and publish it all in one place. This helped us better understand how the virus was spreading and what types of interventions were needed to limit the infections. We combined this information with data on social determinants to see how COVID-19 was concretely affecting vulnerable communities across the country. Our partner, CORE, for example, use this knowledge to work with the Navajo Nation on improving access to testing, successfully administering hundreds of thousands of additional tests. Our experience fighting COVID-19 has clearly shown us the concrete impact data can have on pandemic response. And you've heard, just heard from Dr. Tedros, so I'm echoing his comments, uh, his commitment and his sentiments on this. But now, imagine if we could use this information to stop health threats before they even emerge. This is the thinking behind our new Pandemic Prevention Institute, which will leverage all kinds of data to anticipate, detect, and track new health threats. As part of its work, this Pandemic Prevention Institute will look at traditional health data sources and non-traditional data like Google search analyses, or perhaps the purchasing and travel data. Why? because non-health data can also show us important trends. For example, an uptick in medicine sales in one community tells us that it may be dealing with more, than, more illnesses than usual, possibly signaling a new outbreak. Moving forward, consistent data analysis will continue to make a difference in COVID-19 response and our preparedness for other health threats. Consider this, your phone can already tell you to carry an umbrella because it's going to rain. So what, would it, what if it could also say when to wear masks to prevent sickness? That is the power of data in pandemic prevention. In this sense, the 3D Commission report comes at a crucial time. By following its recommendations to systematically collect data on social determinants, use it to inform decision-making and consistently make it available to relevant communities. We can make better health for all a reality. Thank you all for being here and congratulations again to the 3D Commission on the launch of your report and the vital work you do every day. Namaste. Thank you, Dr. Rao. Um, thank you in particular for um, being a, for really having the vision to, to uh, launch this effort um, about two and a half years ago and for being a partner and a friend to the commission throughout. And uh, I thought it was particularly important to hear from Naveen about how this fits in with the broader arc of the work that the foundation is doing and, uh, and really to elevate how this work now intersects with COVID and how we think about data going forward. What I want to do now is to really show a, a few slides, literally um, um, uh, seven slides that summarize quickly the commission work. And because I thought it would be helpful for the audience to ground us in what the commission has actually come up with, the principles and recommendations. And then we're going to turn it over to the panelists where we can uh, have the panelists address some of these um, concepts and open it up to Q&A. So I'm going to share my screen. Uh, so the commission was, um, uh, which uh, we've come to refer to as the 3D commission, really is because it's about data, the intersection of data, social determinants, and decision making. The impetus behind the commission was a recognition that over the past 10 years, the world has really come around to understand how the determinants of health are not simply medical and biological, but they're also social and economic. Of course, it was a realization that uh, became embedded in our consciousness over the past 10 years and COVID-19, as uh, Naveen mentioned, surfaced this and very much brought it to light. But when we conceived of the commission, it was before COVID-19, it was before perhaps that great awareness and dawning that has happened during COVID. But the question was, now that we understand that, what are the data that we can use to measure these social determinants? And how can we make sure that we use those data to measure social determinants so that we make decisions that have the social determinants in mind in a way to promote health? In thinking through this question and thinking through where the literature was and where our global understanding of social determinants was, we decided that the way to one way to address this would be to put together a high level commission. These are all the commissioners. We had 24 commissioners from all over the world, and you're going to be hearing from six of them today. I am deeply grateful to all of them for agreeing to be a part of this. We uh, followed the old adage of asking very busy people to do something else, recognizing that they would actually do it well and uh, effectively. And the commissioners worked together over the past two years to come up both with the report 
uh, that I'm summarizing today, but also with a body of scholarship that has now been emerging and has been published to try to build up our an encouragement to all of us to think about how we can use better data to characterize social determinants. I would encourage anybody in the audience to take a look at the commission's website, which you can just Google by 3dcommission.health, where you will see a number of the other articles published in the peer reviewed literature. I think there are about 25 articles that have emerged over the past couple of years that really started to build the body of evidence around this and to encourage us all to, to do better work to think about data informing the social determinants. The commission's deliberations were, uh, um, unfortunately, all um, happened on Zoom. Uh, our um, commission ended up over the past uh, year and a half never meeting in person based on the, on the COVID times, which as everybody can imagine, added a layer of complexity and uh, difficulty. And uh, I am uh, particularly grateful to all the commissioners for their work in, uh, in staying with us and for their engagement despite the challenges of the COVID moment. Just one very simple slide of background is that although I can say in the same breath that um, the world has come to realize the importance of social determinants. This is from a survey that we commissioned in six countries by the commission. When we ask people all over the world, so what do you think most drives your health? Healthcare remains the dominant answer. 25% of people said healthcare was the thing that drives health more. Interestingly, education came in second and everything else sort of grumbles along in about the 10%. So even in a time where we begin to recognize that social and economic determinants matter and are importantly formative for health, most of us still think that healthcare is what matters most for health, even as, and from an expert space, healthcare is generally thought to be 10, 20% of health, while social and economic forces matter for about the other 80%. The uh, thinking and building on um, a large body of scholarship over the past quarter century, particularly anchored by the 2008 um, report from the World Health Organization that was chaired by Sir Michael Marmot, really the thinking has been that there are a full range of forces from politics to governance, to features of neighborhoods and communities, to social positions, social networks, assets and wealth that we all have, all of which influence our behavior and intersects, yes, with our physiology and genetics to produce individual and population health outcomes over the life course. And this model here, I think, is fair to say a fairly standard model now of how we think about social determinants of health. The opportunity presented by this model is that it's an opportunity to recognize the full range of forces that shape health. The challenge embedded in this model is how does one actually systematically go about assessing the key elements of these inputs and how does then go, one go about taking that assessment and practically translating it into action for health. And uh, this is another figure from the report which really tries to capture some of this. On the left is how we see the current decision-making process is that there are multiple competing priorities there are social determinants, all of that sort of enters into a, a competitive funnel until some decision making happens that leans on whatever politically emerges um, to the fore at the moment. A more desirable decision making for health would be one that actually takes into account the full set of factors as a web of interlinked factors and that where that informs all decision making at local, national, regional, um, and global levels, where we recognize that decisions made on transportation, decisions made on housing, decisions made on financing, fundamentally all have implications for health. If I may just ground it in the COVID moment for a second, because Dr. Rao introduced the COVID moment, we saw very much in the COVID moment how it was decisions about essential work, it was decisions about transportation, it was decisions about housing and eviction, those were the decisions that fundamentally influenced whether or not people developed COVID, whether or not they got severe COVID, whether or not people died from COVID. So the COVID moment really represented an encapsulation of a lot of these ideas. And what the commission was trying to do is to say, can we take decision-making processes for health, inform them with better data around social determinants to create better decision-making for health? A number of things emerged in our conversation, and I just want to highlight just one element. Um, uh, from the report before I talk about the principles and recommendations. And um, it was uh, the, the need for thinking about trust in data, a need for thinking not just about technology that can transform our understanding, not just thinking about different types of data and how we translate the data, but how there needs to be a real focus on trust in data to result in data for health equity. And this is from one of the boxes that is in the report. And this we thought was particularly important 
I think the commission would have thought this, were, this was important, would have emerged from the commission's deliberations no matter what. But with the commission's deliberations happening against the backdrop of COVID, it became even more important to recognize that collecting data to inform our understanding of social determinants to the end of making better decisions ultimately would end up being fruitless without population trust in those data, population trust in decision makers' intentions to promote health. And talk about a concrete example of that as we hear about, uh, as we see the vaccine rollout in particular countries and all over the world. So the commission report really culminates in a set of principles and a set of recommendations. Obviously in this space of, uh, in, in this kind of format, I'm not going to go into all of them in detail, but I did want to show, uh, show them to this group and uh, all of this is now available on our website. But there are six principles that uh, emerge from the commission deliberations and briefly, I mean, they're all represented here, but I'm just going to label each of them briefly. Um, the first principle is that if we are to make decisions that really improve health, we need to move beyond health healthcare and incorporate data on all the social determinants. The second principle is decisions about investments in any sector, going again from housing to transportation, all need to keep health in mind. That does not mean that health is the only end, but it means that health needs to be borne in mind. In uh, many countries around the world right now, there are, for example, dis decisions being made about things like eviction moratoria, keeping people in their homes in a time of economic recession. Well, that has health implications. The third principle is that decision-making that affects health needs to also, uh, is inseparable from decisions about equity. That our goal is not simply to improve health overall, but also to improve health equity, to narrow health gaps. The fourth principle is that we should be willing to embrace all available data resources to inform decision-making about health. And this, the commission thought was a particularly important principle because often when we talk about data, we get into this mindset that said, well, when we talk about data, do we mean, well, we might mean only survey data, or perhaps we might mean only big data that comes from social media. No, we should be thinking about all data resources, starting from community-based, community-gathered um, data, community-generated data, all the way to data that comes from the big data sources that come from our transactions over the web today. The fifth principle is that we need better more transparent and more accountable governance. And data could go some ways towards that, where if data that's collected are available in such a way as to surface the determinants and the health outcomes. And if we can use data to create a transparency, it can actually create more accountability and more transparent governance that will help us all. And the sixth principle is that evidence-informed decision-making needs to be participatory and inclusive of multiple perspectives. There was quite a bit of discussion in the commission around the oftentimes the hierarchical top-down gathering of data where data is gathered by them, the experts, aiming to help us, the people. Well, well what, where, that, where those, but those lines need to be blurred and needs to be removed where we actually have true community engagement in informing what the data are so that that can then become data that is acted on in a way that generates trust, in a way that is transparent, and in a way that's accountable. So these were the six principles that emerged from the commission, and this, the principles led to four recommendations. As uh, everybody, everybody knows in any commission like this, there is an abundant room for dozens and dozens of recommendations. And we, we specifically wanted to keep the recommendations focused and brief um, um, to, to the end, hopefully, of making them practical. So the first recommendation is that we should be collectively, all of us, global, regional, local entities, should be collecting and making available quality data that characterize the full range of determinants of health, including, for example, housing, education, economics, and make sure that those are available to decision makers and communities. This goes back to the trust cycle that I talked about earlier. The second is specifically for national governments, that these data collection processes should be developed in a transparent way. And we should be transparent and explicit that these data are used in decision-making processes. Again, I would hearken back to the COVID moment and think how much more trust we would have generated if decisions made about COVID were actually made explicitly grounded in data, where the decision-making was explained as being data-driven and where the data were available so that everybody could see why the decisions were made, even if they disagreed with them. 
The third recommendation is that all bodies, regional, national, local entities, and funders should embed follow through to ensure accountability for data informed decision making. That we're not going to be building this trust in data of which we have spoken unless it is clear that as action is taken on data, we are accountable to that action. It is not good enough to say, let's make all this effort to collect data and that should inform decision-making and then stop there. There needs to be accountability and a feedback loop to say, how have we done and should we update our actions? I come back again to the COVID example. A lot of the global challenges that we've had on trust have been not only that decisions are being made in a way that is not transparent, not clearly informed by the data, but also where there's no accountability for bad decision-making or for decision-making that is not adequately informed by data. And the fourth and last recommendation is that relevant bodies, again, including funders, should center community engagement in the acquisition and interpret interpretation of data and making such data widely available to relevant communities. And as you can see, this ties back to loop. This goes back to that one slide I showed you with trust being put at the center, that as we move to a world where more data are available, we felt it was, it was important that we cannot simply be leading thought on bringing data to bear on social determinants without making it very clear that those data need to be collected in a way that generates trust so that the data are trusted and decisions that are informed by the data are themselves trusted. And to do that, one needs transparency and accountability. And I have come to see this almost as a circle, almost as a hopefully a virtuous circle. Community engagement in the data collected, data being collected on the full range of determinants, that being used to inform decision-making that is accountable and transparent to generate decisions that fundamentally generate the health of communities. The commission, the commission held back, held back from um, making recommendations, for example, on specific bodies or specific entities that should be created on this, largely because we felt a it was early in our whole global reckoning with these issues to make such specific recommendations, and b recognizing that this was a time of turmoil, a time of real change around COVID, and c that there may be different solutions in different national and regional contexts. But our hope is that this is actually followed up with practicable, practicable efforts with real structures put in place to enable this gathering of data in a way that is accountable and transparent to the end of characterizing social determinants and creating better decision making. I will stop there. I really I said I wanted to share just seven slides because, but I did think it was important on the launch of the report to give everybody a flavor of the content of, um, uh, of the report. And I would encourage everybody to go on the commission website and take a look at the report yourself. Now I'm going to turn it over to our panel. And uh, the format now is I'm going to introduce the whole panel all at once. And uh, just so everybody knows who the panelists are. And then I'm going to go through panelists by panelists. And I'm going to ask each of the panelists to reflect from their lens, from their perspective on um, elements of the commission report. Once the panelists have reflected, I will direct some um, Q&A and the audience will have the opportunity to ask questions and we'd encourage you to ask questions through the Q&A function in Zoom. So we're very fortunate to have six panelists or six members of the commission. And the commission as following the pattern of the data determinants decision-making also was divided into three subgroups, one on data, one on determinants and the sit and one on decision making. And each subgroup had two chairs. And the six panelists are the chairs of each of the three subgroups. So the co-chairs of the data subgroups were Dr. Heidi Larson and Dr. Curie. Dr. Larson is a professor of anthropology, risk and decision science, and director of the Vaccine Confidence Project at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Dr. Curie, Dr. Rhee, is a senior vice president of CBS Health and chief medical officer of Aetna CBS Health. On the determinant subgroup, it was chaired by Dr. Mberu and Dr. Magania. Dr. Blessing Mberu is head of urbanization and well-being, African Population and Health Research Center. And Dr. Magania is the president and CEO of the Association of Schools and Programs of Public Health. And the decision-making working group was co-chaired by Dr. Jeffrey Sturcio, who was at the time the chairman of Raven Martin, and Dr. Nana Tumdanso, who was the senior vice president of Global for the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. If I may just say at the beginning, it has been a true privilege to work with all six of these commissioners as it has been with the rest of the commission. Uh, but these six commissioners have done a lot of work in particular leading their work groups towards both producing some of the peer review papers that I've mentioned earlier, as well as to generating the relevant parts in the commission report. So with that introduction, 
I'm now going to turn it over to each commission in turn, and I'm going to start start with Dr. Larson. Heidi, microphone's yours. Thanks, um, Sandro. It's been a real honor to be part of this commission, and and great to hear the diversity across the the different partners. I I know you were. Um, interested in an example um, from the Vaccine Confidence Project that kind of puts in a tangible sense uh, some, of, some of the principles and, and things we've come across and, and recommended in the report. And one is the importance of the multiplicity of, of data. Um, and I think that uh, Naveen has already talked about the the importance of looking at alternative sources like the update and medicine data, things, asking different kinds of questions, going to different sources. Um, and I think that uh, in, the, in the case of vaccines, uh, we typically look at vaccine uptake, uh, but when we're trying to look at confidence, which is trying to go a bit upstream to try to anticipate willingness to, to take a vaccine, we need to ask different questions. So we do that through a mix of surveys um, and that's, we try to get representativeness, the importance too of repeating it over time. But at the same time, we wanna look at health data records. We wanna look at vaccination records, but then we also want the real time issues, the social media data, the, the search factors that were referred to earlier and how that gives us a different uh, insight and helps us explain maybe why there are ups and downs in some of these different uh, data points. Um, I'll give you an example. We've been monitoring closely confidence around the COVID vaccine in different settings, particularly in Africa, uh, but, but globally. And in Nigeria, we saw a dramatic drop from uh, last June, 2020, uh, 49% of a representative sample were saying definitely uh, strongly agree uh, vaccines are safe, the COVID vaccines will be safe. Um, in March 2021, we saw a dramatic decline to 25%. And then you start listening to social media and you see day by day, it reflected changing sentiments, new reports in Europe about an adverse event. And so you see how quickly these dynamics can change and impact. Uh, that's just a quick example. I know we're supposed to only have a few minutes here each, but just to give some tangible examples about how these different real-time background data, slow data, fast data, um, uh, make a difference in, in getting us a more comprehensive understanding. Thank you, Heidi. Thank you, Dr. Larson. Um, uh, Dr. Rhee, and um, talk about your roles and your intersection with data and making that available. And, and thank you for having me and just thank you for the work of the commission and, and your leadership, Sandro. Um, from, from my perspective throughout my career from a primary care physician to a public health professional and the role I believe that uh, the private sector has in public health right now, um, I've come to this recognition that data is not neutral and and there's uh, such an important need to align the right determinants um, with the data. And so it really is about transforming or translating that data into insights and making sure it goes into the right part of a decision maker's workflow at the right time to make the right decision. Um, and ideally that decision should be about health equity and health justice. So as I reflect um, in, in terms of where we are today and the role that CVS Health and Aetna has played during this pandemic, I think about the four curves of COVID. We've all acquired a literacy about a, a data set about understanding how the curves of COVID related to cases, hospitalizations, and deaths is something we as a country and as a, as a, as a globe need to address. And so as you think about the, the curve that we often focus on, the infectious disease curve, I'm proud of how we've leveraged data determinants and decisions to help support more than 30 million COVID vaccines in this country, in the US. Um, I'm also proud of the fact that we've helped provide 70% of all the re, uh, COVID-19 retail testing. Uh, when you look at the issues that we started during this pandemic around long-term care facilities, 40,000 sites, we delivered that and reduced the rate of deaths by 94% and rate of cases by 
Once again, leveraging data determinants and decisions. And as I reflect on the other curves of COVID that we're now discovering, that we're always there to begin with, but that we need to flatten, chronic disease, if you think about the fact that we're looking at the data, many people are delaying necessary care. They're not getting their medications. They're not getting their cancer screenings. It's so important that we recognize that that is a curve we need to continue to address and flatten. Mental illness is another curve. Um, we've discovered in our data that, unfortunately, there's been an increase in suicides. We've also discovered that certain age groups are, are having higher rates of depression and anxiety disorders. And so we've been looking at ways we could offer in person, but especially telehealth, virtual care, where nearly now 60 to 65% of all of our mental health visits are delivered through teletherapy. The last curve, which I think we're all so passionate about is the importance of flattening the curve in, of inequities, not only domestically, but across the globe. And so we've been using data to look at where we place testing sites. More than 50% of all of our testing sites are in underserved communities to help prevent that spread. 34% of our vaccinations have been given to underrepresented minorities. And going back to the issue of trust, I think so much of this is about the people who serve and those who they are serving. And we're proud of the fact that our workforce represents that diversity. 50% of our pharmacy technicians are non-white, 40% of our pharmacists are non-white. And I believe that plays a very important role. The last point I'll make is the importance of tech equity, which you reference and trust. And just thinking about a diverse workforce, data trust, equity dashboards, and leveraging analytics and AI that's transparent and equitable to advance health equity. Thank you, Dr. Rhee. And uh, thank you in particular for your work on um, the six T's of data, which actually, which I highlighted earlier, which really emerged from uh, your thought leadership. Thank you. Um, next, I'm gonna move on to Dr. Blessing and Barrow. Dr. Barrow, as I said, uh, co-chaired the determinants uh, um, uh, section of this work. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, our efforts to try to remove boundaries between different groups of determinants and integrate those into a holistic approach to data measurement towards the end of informing decision-making. Blessing. Blessing. Yeah. Thanks, thanks, Sandro, and thanks, uh, Laura, my co-chair, and thanks everyone for the opportunity to work with this commission. Yeah, I mean, and I think the issue around social determinants is central here. You know, if, if you are looking at data, you have to look at the right data you know, data that is generated for specific contexts. You know, in many situations, uh, the visions may be global. Like we are looking at SDGs, we are looking at universal health coverage, we are looking at issues around global equity. But you know that uh, the world is not <laughs> naturally equal, both in terms of data and in terms of even capacity to use data. So one of the things that stood out for me in this commission is the opportunity to highlight the fact that while the visions may be global, the challenges are actually local. So local context matters. In fact, we have evidence that you know, health programming for local governments and implementing agencies are often hindered by lack of local data to identify priorities to evaluate progress of whatever interventions that are going on and to pinpoint what works or what does not work for local communities. And that is where issue of social determinants comes to play. A lot of societies we all know are not at the same place. When you look at the development spectrum, it's a wide spectrum, you know, for some of us working in low and medium income countries, what you see is that if you look at many of the globally published data, you come to certain countries or many countries in Africa and you will see just NA, not available or not, uh, or dash. So, and I think the issue of all data came up. I think Naveen mentioned that, the use of all data. And that is where we think that it is important to highlight the fact that 
big data is good, but if you don't have it, there are other local variations. And that is where you need to, we talk about investment at local, very local levels, like where we are, you know, to be able to generate data that is specifically relevant on different social determinants for different groups. For example, if you look at women like children, people with disability, yes. distress migrants like IDPs, refugees and asylum seekers, these are not major groups that feature in very big data. But if you invest at the local level, you will be able to generate this kind of data that will be relevant. And again, we have talked about COVID. COVID is a very good example. We lack so much data around COVID that even the responses looked very draconian. I mean, people live in informal settlements, they don't really have real house homes. So they can't really isolate there. The houses are very hot in the day and very cold at night. That's why they want, and most of them are informal workers that live on daily wages. So while we want to prevent COVID infection and spread, most of them had a, a, an emergency threat of hunger if they are not working because they need to you know, generate income on a daily basis. So in essence, low investment in local data collection and analysis is what we have emphasized in this commission looking at social determinants to furnish robust evidence that can inform both policy and action. And one of the things I want to say, Sandro, and to, to this group is capacity building at the local level to enhance these activities need to be also part of the priorities. And I'm happy Navid is here. A lot of institutions in the global south have capacity to fill this data gap. But of course, you know the funding challenges. So I want to stop there, but it's a pleasure working with this group. Thank you, Sandro, for your leadership that helps us to emphasize some of these issues. Thank you very much. Thank you, Blessing. Next, we move on to uh, Dr. Magania, who will um, talk a little bit about um, how she sees this intersection of data social determinants in her role, particularly overseeing the academic public health enterprise. Thank you, Sandra, for your leadership. It has been a great honor to work with all these incredible colleagues. So hopefully by now, we all know that the only way to significantly advance the health and the well-being of population is through the lenses of social determinants of health. But because what makes people healthy or sick in the very first place are the conditions in the environment in which people are born, live, play, learn, work, and age. So these conditions are constantly affecting the health outcomes. So data on the social determinants of health can guide the decision-making process to improve health and well-being in many ways, as it is uh, stated in the report. But I would just mention just three as an example. By revealing the structures of inequalities and power, by targeting specific populations at higher risk, and by guiding the decisions about the effective interventions. So I just mentioned two main challenges to addressing social determinants of health among the many challenges mentioned on the report. Number one is that many, that many determinants fall outside of the health sector. So decision makers in non-health fields do not always account for health indicators when measuring success within their sectors. Some connections are well known, such as environment and cultural factors that can affect health, but many likely do not realize that decisions made regarding where a road is built or how a product is marked can impact the health of communities near or far from the road and who are, who are not target for a specific product. And secondly, the lack of political will. So even when social determinants are well known, developing policies to address them will often not yield immediate visible uh, results. But there is often little incentive for elected politicians to invest in these types of programs and policies. When there is incentive, decision makers often take actions based on their own knowledge, experience, and positions in society. However, their personal reality may be vastly different from those individuals within the community who will be most affected by their decisions. So overcoming these challenges will require a common language and an understanding that improved health translate to returns on financial investment and gains in productivity as well as overall population uh, well-being. So decision makers should seek out meaningful engagement with community stakeholders to garner support for their initiatives and ensure they meet the community's needs. Uh, promoting population health 
is a choice that the decision maker must make consciously regardless of short-term political uh, pressures. So schools and programs of public health as well as other academic institutions are important partners for government agencies to help policymakers understand and translate data on the social determinants into actionable recommendations to improve population health uh, outcome. So in the field of academic public health, social determinants of, of health, are in the core of what we do, schools and programs of public health focus their teaching, research, and service on addressing the social determinants of health. More can be done, of course, to ensure that all academic accreditation agencies of at least the health professions require evidence to their graduates of deeply understanding and acting on social determinants of health. What this report has shown us, as well as the last 18 months have highlighted, is that our educational system operates in silos as well. So the health professionals are not trained together as a team with the health of the population in front and center of all our curriculums. So if we are asking for more intersectorial work and a holistic systems thinking approach, we should start with transforming the educational structure to allow for more interprofessional education within the health professions, but even beyond them, including engineers, architects, lawyers that can think on how their field of study or work impacts the health and the well-being of populations. I stop there. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Magania. As a, someone whose uh, institutional day job is uh, leading a school of public health, uh, those comments are particularly resonant. Um, I'm ne now going to move on to Dr. Jeffrey Sturcio. As I mentioned, Dr. Sturcio and Dr. Tun Danso co-chaired the decision-making um, pillar of the, the commission's work. And uh, Jeff is going to talk a little bit about um, steps decision-makers can take to actually ensure they are centering some of the ideas that emerge from the commission. Jeff. Thanks, Sandro. <clears throat> I'd, I'd like to focus on two aspects of the work that the commission did, <clears throat> namely um, thinking about having a common language for talking about and making decisions. Uh, and secondly, I'd like to add a little bit more um, texture to the comments Sandra made earlier about the role of communities in uh, coming up with better decision-making processes. <clears throat> Excuse me, let me just take some water here. Uh, and I'll be building on the comments that my colleagues have made already. You know, one of the things that we discovered is that in decision making in uh, in health, if you look at it from the most the broadest perspective, we're interested in making better decisions so that we'll have uh, improved population health uh, to the optimum extent with the resources that are available. Uh, and one of the challenges in looking at the work that the commission reviewed is that decision makers often come from a disciplinary background where they're either um, lawyers, economists, um, policy, uh, you know, come from different policy disciplines. Uh, and they think in terms of economic metrics, of policy processes, of priority setting, of return on investment. Whereas the social scientists, many of whom were members of our commission, uh, come from different disciplines where we're more concerned with understanding the conditions of everyday life. Uh, as Laura said, where people, where and how people live, learn, work, and play. Uh, and sometimes, uh, although policymakers and, um, and scientists and public health professionals are interested in the same goals, uh, they come at it with language that often seems incommensurable. Uh, and by focusing on data and uh, social determinants, um, our conviction is that this helps to provide a common language uh, in several ways that can lead to improved decisions. Um, one of the papers that the working group published uh, was on thinking about um, these decision-making frameworks. Uh, and there are three particular areas uh, to focus on. One is uh, the context of decisions. Uh, you know, most uh, policy decisions have to be made under conditions of uncertainty where you can't wait for all the data to be in. Uh, and to have those decisions be seen as legitimate and gain public support uh, it's important to really um, address the kind of political constraints, complexity, and competing priorities uh, in a way that demonstrates to people that their interests have been taken into consideration. That's one reason why we think it's so important uh, to have communities be uh, fully integrated into the decision-making processes, and I'll come back to that point. Uh, secondly, uh, decisions are made most effectively through coalitions of, of interests. 
Uh, and that's why we focus so much on incorporating stakeholders from different levels and sectors of governance in decision-making processes uh, so that those decisions are seen to be legitimate and do have the kind of public support that we're looking for. And finally, the content of the issues is very important. And that's where data and social determinants uh, come in directly because they help us understand that content better uh, and lead to, uh, to better decisions. Now, one example, and another one of the papers that was published in the Journal of Urban Health that came from this working group, uh, took a look at uh, bus rapid transit in Lagos, Bogota, and Beijing. Uh, and you know, while the principles uh, of healthy transportation were seen in the design of those systems, in practice, uh, they didn't really address those considerations adequately. Uh, and transportation networks can improve lifestyle and, and non-communicable disease choices, but health has to be considered as a factor in designing those networks. Whereas if you have safe, affordable, and effective forms of transport, what we found was that this can encourage walking and cycling, reduce traffic congestion, reduce air pollution, uh, promote social inclusion, all of which will lead to better health outcomes. Uh, and the collaborative frameworks that can come from a health and all policy approach, uh, taking data and decision-making, uh, excuse me, uh, determinants into account can lead to better decision-making and better health outcomes. And then finally on communities, I just wanted to reiterate the point uh, that we feel that integrating and reflecting on the insights from the lived experiences of those people directly affected by social determinants and the decisions that policymakers are taking about uh, health outcomes will lead to <clears throat> more dynamic policy options uh, and to choices that actually are going to lead to better population health. And that <clears throat> collaborating with community makers when collecting and interpreting data is also vital to improving population health because it fosters trust between communities and decision makers. Um, and that I just want to underscore as my final point that several of my colleagues have already made uh, an allusion to the importance of trust uh, in working on decision making in, in healthcare. Uh, and by incorporating communities into the processes by which those decisions get made, by using data from the community, by uh, incorporating an understanding of social determinants as lived by those communities, uh, that helps people to make much more robust decisions uh, that reflect the contexts of, uh, of how those decisions are going to be implemented. Uh, and that will lead ultimately to improve population health, which is the goal that the commission had as its, uh, its North Star through all the work that we uh, that we did. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Dr. Sturchum. And now to Dr. Twum Danso. And um, Nana's going to talk a little bit about how one can actually integrate every sector in decision-making processes, and in particular, how to grapple with the multiple competing issues that decision-makers have to take into account, and particularly more so as we challenge them to broaden their lens to social determinants. Dr. Twum Danso. Yeah, thank you, Sandro. Um, so I've been thinking about this question quite a bit over the past two years of working uh, on this commission. And I think a lot of it starts from political prioritization. You know, the, the competing priorities that decision makers have to make are so many that we have to start with prioritization because that focuses attention and is in many ways forces decision-making to happen in a timely manner. I think the other component is civil society's action, like civil, civil society's action in wanting decisions to be made about a particular issue can accelerate the pace of decision-making using all sorts of data. Thirdly, we have to think about the economic um, feasibility. Is there fiscal space to make that decision and fund the budget that will actually uh, impact population health. And I think those three are really important before we can even get to the, the data that influences that. One of the areas that I found very encouraging in the past uh, year and a half of the COVID pandemic is the availability of data and the timeliness of data in parts of the world where we never thought it would be possible. You know, the, the work I do in quality improvement in health and healthcare we love to see data on 
in real time, however you define real time, whether it's daily or weekly or monthly. And in many parts of the world, especially in low resource settings, availability, availability of data is really difficult, especially real time. And then the completeness, the accuracy and the timeliness, but we've seen in COVID that even in the most resource constrained settings, we are able to see daily or at least every other day updates of the COVID pandemic, number of cases, number of deaths and where the deaths are happening so that decision makers can, can guide resources accordingly. In addition, poll surveys, which you know, in the past, a large scale population surveys would take a year to collect or months to collect the data, a year or more to do the analysis and make them available. We're thinking about you know, DHS survey data, et cetera. But with the pandemic, with political prioritization, with um, decision makers' attention and funding available, we are able to see pulse survey data happening and results available within a month. And then you know, three months later, another pulse survey happening uh, across populations on health and social conditions, housing, food insecurity, et cetera. So I think in, in many ways, the pandemic has shown us what is possible. It is possible with the right amount of political prioritization, activism from civil society and the media. Media attention is very good for focusing attention on, um, on what matters to people. Um, community activism is really key. And then we have to find the economic space to, to make this happen. So my, my takeaway from this commission is that the potential is there. We, the health and public health care and public health people need to find ways to help decision makers prioritize the, the interventions that will have impact on all of health, especially social determinants of health. So we all know, for example, uh, let's, think, let's take malaria for an example. We can continue with the pharmaceutical approach to malaria where we treat people who are sick or we do uh, prophylactic treatment, but again, it's pharmaceutical, prophylactic treatment daily or whatever for pregnant women or for infants, it's pharmaceutical, it's not addressing the root causes. How do we get political prioritization around root causes for malaria control? How do we deal with the sanitation uh, challenges in communities where you know, there's stagnant water all the time? How do we deal with housing with poor, uh, windows and doors that allow the mosquitoes to get in at night. Those are really structural um, political issues that governments have to take on. And the easy solution is the pharmaceutical one, uh, partly because you know, the, there's donor availability, the, there's a biomedical model that we have all gravitated, we, a lot of us have gravitated towards over the years. And when you go with a biomedical model, a pharmaceutical solution seems appropriate. But if you come from a population health, social determinants perspective and think long-term about the people who live in the conditions and work in those conditions, then we have to think more about the root causes and we think about sanitation, water, housing, et cetera. So I think I, I, want, to, I want to stay optimistic that the, I know it's hard because a lot of this costs huge amounts of money. But money can be found. We've seen billions, trillions of dollars go towards COVID. And so we know the money is there if, if people prioritize. How do we get people to prioritize in a more fundamental social determinants way rather than keep going along the biomedical model that so many people have been going down for decades? So on that note, let me start. That's wonderful. Thank you. I, I actually uh, have been particularly struggling with this question of now that we know the money's there, um, how does that change our perspective? It's, uh, it's been on my mind very much in the time of COVID. Um, thank you, everybody, for your comments. And uh, I'll invite the audience to put questions in the Q&A, which I'll get to in a second. But I had a couple of questions which I wanted to uh, pose to the panel, which really just to surface some of the other key themes from the report that did not emerge from the panelists' brief remarks. So let me start with um, the diversity of perspectives. And um, maybe, Nana, since you have the microphone, I suppose, in a in a virtual world, I can start by asking you, can you talk a little bit about the key steps that you think are important to make sure that a diversity of perspectives are taken into account in decision-making? Yeah, yeah, it's a great question. I'm sure many of you have heard that phrase, nothing for us without us. 
Um, I don't know exactly where the quote come from, where the quote comes from. I can't take credit for it, but I have heard it, and it's it's really true, uh, because as Blessing uh, said a few minutes ago, context really does matter. Lived experience really does matter as we shape. Um, uh, policies and programs to support the people in a particular uh, context. So I think from a decision maker's perspective, we have to be much more deliberate in looking for the diversity of opinions for the particular area, whether it's, um, you know, the, the, the education sector, the um, transportation sector, the communities that are affected by whatever policies or uh, programs might be made with regard to schools, or uh, school feeding. I mean, there's, there's such a wide range of areas where too often decisions are made top down. And then we only realize a, a month or you know a few months or years later that it wasn't actually appropriate. And people can either ignore it and allow it to be done to them and just shrug their shoulders and give up because the process doesn't work. Or we um, can engage them more and help shape it and help refine it as we go along. We know that the, the data sources are not as many as would like. We know the data quality is not always good. Timeliness is a challenge. So decision makers are making decisions with imperfect data, which means that the policies or programs that may be finally decided may not be ideal for the context. But with the spirit of engaging society, civil society, the communities affected, the academics, the people who will evaluate it, in a, in a more proactive way, you can start implementation, you can start learning and get the data back from the few, first few months or first few years to be able to revise it and improve upon it. But I think it comes from starting with knowing that the, the sources of data we are using to make the decision are probably insufficient. The quality of the data is not where we'd like it to be, but that's all we have. And then being humble about the fact that the solution that we have is the best we have at this moment, and we should be receptive to revising it and changing it going forward. Thank you. Let, let me ask a follow-up question. Maybe I can direct this one to um, Heidi, Dr. Larson. Um, uh, talking a little bit about engagement of a diversity of perspectives and engaging multiple stakeholders. I was wondering, Heidi, if you can comment from your lens, building on the remarks you made and some of your other scholarship around the centrality of including multiple stakeholders, including diversity of perspectives and transparency and accountability to the end of building trust, trust in data and trust in actions that flow from data. Big question, Sandra. <laughs> I know it's a big question. Um, you, you may have the next hour and a half to answer. Yeah, I'll, I'll keep it uh, keep it concise. Um, I think you know the reality is is that politicians deal daily with a diversity of opinions, and that's part of the prop challenge. Is um, you know you get some people with the louder voices with more kind of emphasis and they're constantly navigating different sources. So I think part of our challenge, um, and this is where we lose sometimes the trust in, in the data is that people feel like there's no transparency in the process of how those different levers of information are taken, how they're weighted, how they dis determine what affects them. But I think also one of the big things that um, has come to the fore in COVID is, um, I think, uh, I think to, to some surprise among some, maybe not for everyone, we had a lot of, a number of significant national leaders in the world who did not go with the science, who did not follow the data, who um, almost went almost against the data. And in that, in that absence of central leadership, in a sense, um, I think where we saw some successes in terms of engaging and, and using um, resourcefully data at a community level is, is local efforts, local mayors, local leaders, others who um, turned to the different sources. And I think, you know, there's this kind of expert public um, polarity that sometimes people 
use. But what I hear from a lot of the people that we listen to, we spend a lot of time listening. That's what the Vaccine Confidence Project is all about, listening. Um, and I think that, you know, what they're saying, what they're screaming in a way is, we are, our, we are experts. We are experienced experts. We are experts in our realities. And you, and you have to take that into account. Your big data and your numbers may tell you one story, but that ain't my life. Um, and so I think that um, one of the things that I wrote in my book, Stuck, was about the fact that, you know, after the Enlightenment, um, science and data was the freedom, the freedom from religious dogma. But what I'm hearing in publics all over the world is that the new dogma is science. Science says, therefore you do. And that's, that's not working anymore. And we're getting a reverse. People are going back to religion. People are going to faith. They're going to their communities. They're going to, as one woman told me, I'll believe it when somebody that looks and talks like me tells me, not you. Um, and or not X, Mr. X, who comes from a city far away. So I think the transparency of processes of decision making, but I think also that um, the reality is the public is really engaged. That's been our biggest challenge. They're more engaged than some of the, pu the public health leaders or the or the you know the scientific leaders in a sense and that's been our challenge we weren't ready for the level of questioning resistance persistence so they're real engaged we just need to catch up with them in some ways or somehow find that dialogue and that's that's the challenge i think we have a huge diversity of data now it's somehow getting it to knit itself together into a better solution together Thank you. I, I'm going to resist to do, asking a follow-up about science and the nature of science, science becoming the new religion. That's a separate conversation, but I think it's such an interesting topic. Thank you. Um, uh, let me um, ask a different question, maybe a blessing I can direct this one to you. And uh, because I, wanna, I want to um, center uh, health equity and uh, we, we spend a lot of time discussing this in the commission. And I think the commissioners were fairly of one mind around this, that um, when we talk about health, we don't simply mean aggregate health. We actually mean we mean narrowing health gaps. And I was wondering, uh, Dr. Ambero, from your perspective about how do we go about elevating health equity as a national and global concern? And in particular, uh, I've lately been doing more and more thinking and reading and writing around this global health equity and sort of the, how far we are from any form of um, aspirational ideal around the, re, the re genuine notion of global health equity. So I'm just wondering from your perspective about how do we get there? How do we get to a place where health equity is a real active concern rather than simply an aspired ideal? Blessing, I think you're on mute. Well, again, thanks, thanks for that. Thanks for that question. Uh, I mean, uh, I'm not mute. Uh, are you oh, hearing no, me now? Yeah, you're back. You, you froze for a second, but you're okay now. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so I think that is where we are. I mean, if you if you look at the SDG, for instance, uh, you will see that, I mean, everything is on the line. I mean, one of the outcomes there, or one of the expectations there is what everyone is talking about, which is universal health coverage. But you also know, and I think this commission has emphasized that. You see, if you don't measure it, it becomes difficult to talk about that even in policy, talk less of in prioritizing. And I think I alluded to that earlier. And what has happened is that if you look at availability of data, I was in the UK once, and I mean, they have data on <laughs> who bought beer from an, a tavern, who bought it from a supermarket. I mean, they have so much data. And I said, look, you guys are doing bourgeois science here because you, you have all you need to be able to talk about the challenges at the local level. And that is what we have been lacking in low and medium income countries. So I think it, you are right. 
And I've made that point also earlier that these visions are global, whether it's SDG, whether it's universal health coverage. But there are a lot of people that are naturally marginalized. And when you talk about the difference between the North and the South, that is obvious. But what about in the South itself? I work in urban Africa, and if you look at a city like Nairobi, 60% of the city are urban slums. But even when you look at slums, they are not homogeneous. They are so heterogeneous. There are places you have uh, multi-generational families. There are places you have just young people who have just arrived who are working in industrial area. And so the needs are different. The things that should be prioritized are different. The structure, the structure of the population is different. So in essence, I mean, I go back to context. Uh, it's not religion now, but it is actually the fact that if you don't, if you don't have equity in evidence that informs policy, then that policy would definitely be skewed in terms of where data is. And we know where the data gaps are. We know where understanding of social determinants are. And uh, we, we alluded to that a lot in this, our report and this discussion. I can take countries at different levels, different spots rather in the development spectrum, okay? And that's why we have low and medium income countries. I mean, we, the designations keep evolving, okay? But if you look at, for instance, I'm a demographer by training. There are countries that have high fertility rates up to two to 3% growth rates per annum. And, but there are countries that are at replacement fertility, which is 0%. There are also countries that are actually having negative growth and they are declining. So if you look at that broader vision, okay, most of the time when you hear about fertility uh, population dynamics, you keep hearing about countries that have high fertility, but there are also countries that have the, uh, negative, the negative growth. So and those, those uh, trajectories of population change has implications for the age structure of the population and therefore the kind of health challenges across the life course. So in essence, therefore, uh, if we are going to then have health equity, we need to have this spectrum of data and spectrum of analysis and understanding so that we can then feed all of those into policy making, into decision making. And that is for me, one of the ways we can begin to think about addressing equity. You can't address it in a vacuum. You need to know what you're addressing. Then if you come around the global south or you even come, go into the slums, there are specific groups that are so marginalized. Nobody talks about them in, re, in big data. People who are, uh, who are with disability, people who uh, distress migrants, like refugees, urban refugees. So there are those elements groups of subgroups that are marginalized that we need to begin to use data to highlight their situation. And I think that's what we have achieved, if you ask me, at African Population and Health Research Center in the last 20 years. We have highlighted so much the I think Blessing froze at the last minute. Blessing? I think he was finishing his comment. Hopefully, he'll come back. Let me let me go to a different question, and may, I'll take one from the audience. And maybe um, Q, I can direct this one to you. There's a question from uh, Mike Kalmus, which is um, says often public health decision making happens regardless of data, ba based on other incentives, based on political needs and emotions. So the question is, should those generating data be making a more proactive effort, either to understand the wider political economy or the context and the frame that ultimately will imbue data with emotional meaning. Yeah, thank you, Sandra. Look, um, data is not neutral. Um, data is, um, it's a source of power and um, we have to be respectful. And, and, and many people feel that data um, is in, in many ways the new oil, it's a new currency of sorts. And so part of what I wanna highlight is that we all have a responsibility to reflect on the data we use. I, I we can't have perfect be the enemy of the good. So ultimately um, data is not also not perfect. So um, we typically have to make decisions and we have to make it on limited data. 
but to be transparent about um, the limitations of that data, uh, to be transparent about the determinants that that data represents, uh, to be transparent about the fact that often we know that uh, the data that we leverage doesn't represent particularly underserved or marginalized communities, because in many ways, the infrastructure of collecting data, um, either because of trust issues or just infrastructure investments are, are minimal um, or, or not sufficient. Um, I would suggest, for example, in, the, in this age of COVID, I'm fairly confident that many of the reporting at a global level doesn't accurately represent the actual cases of COVID um, across the globe. So uh, much of that is related to that data infrastructure. I also want to highlight, as, as folks have been referencing, I mean, and, and I know I've experienced it in my career as a physician, that we learn a biomedical model. Much of healthcare and medicine is hierarchical, it's vertical. But as we reflect on these topics and issues of trust, transparency, transformation, social determinants of health, you know, data determinants and decisions, ultimately being horizontal. I mean, as I reflect on my two daughters and how they're building new relationships with friends at school, that so much of, of health and healthcare is about trust and, and making sure that um, there's transparency and it's a horizontal relationship. Um, that you make sure everyone's in the room and they have a seat at the table and that they understand there's data literacy as well as health literacy. And so, so much of what we're challenged with is about that issue, I think, and why we continue to have inequities and, and so many um, opportunities to make change, but we haven't necessarily achieved it. Thank you, Q, and welcome back, Blessing. Um, um, I think you had finished your, your comment when, when you froze. We'll come back to you in a bit. Um, uh, let me take a, a, a comment question from um, uh, Kay uh, Rajasekharan. And uh, maybe uh, Laura, Dr. Magania can direct this one to you. Although it's framed as a comment, but I think there's, a real, there's an interesting question here, which is uh, fundamentally, we're missing pieces in the literature about understanding the social determinants data nexus and how it becomes decision making. So I suppose the question, Laura, is what do you think are the biggest missing gaps in our knowledge? And if I may ask you to then extend it to education, what are we, what should we be thinking about in terms of educating the next generation to make sure that we have 20 years from now, 40 years from now, this conversation has moved forward, that data truly are being used to inform a full range of determinants understanding to the end of making better decisions. Thank you for the question, because I, I really believe that we should start very early in the educational system. It's not about graduates, it's not even about high school, it's about really primary, K to 12. We really need to educate, we have the obligation to educate the next generation of citizens, first of all. And we can imagine a new world if, if in the content of public health, like public health 101, should be thought from K to, to 12 in the very first place. If we all are citizens educated about how to take care of, of us and our, our environment and the planet, that should be integrated into our DNA from the first day that, that we are in the school. I think we should, there's a lot to be done in the educational system in order to really have immersed, integrated, the basic knowledge of, uh, of, of health and well, well-being in all the you know, educational system. And of course, then further on in high school, community colleges, undergraduate and the graduate, we should insist in how to be in advance in all these topics. And there's, there's a lot of gaps. I think that number one is because social determinants of health is not as a core fundamental knowledge at least in the health professions, and of course, beyond the health professions. You know, I've been, I am a lot of times uh, involved in conversations with my colleagues in, 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 the, in the health professions. And I think that we have the obligation, the public health uh, professionals, in order to really change the conversation, because it's about prevention, it's about well-being, it's about social determinants, you know, it's not just about health care. It's very tough to make those, uh, to stand up there. So I think that, First of all, I think that we need to start with the family, we need to start with the health professionals, but even beyond that in all professionals, I mean, we really need to have uh, to invest all the knowledge, the public health knowledge in the other professions. So everyone in the future 
can be thinking about public, I mean, the impact of, of laws and the impact of roads and the impact of building a community, uh, the impact of all of that in, in well being and, 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 and health. So we must change the conversation to well being. And I, in my career, in my experience, I have found that it's easier to talk about well being, the impact of the, all professions in well being, as opposed to talk about health, because not everyone relates to health at the same way that we you know, understand health. But they do relate with well-being, so they can see the impact of their careers or their fields of in, in, in well in well-being. And let me just add maybe to this conversation because we we, we kind of uh, see the consequence without uh, looking at it's because the formation is because the education that we all the background that we all have. But I really think that the pandemic has highlighted many health inequities and the impact of the social determinants. And this is the time. This is the right time to build on the lessons we learned these past 18 months. So, so I think that uh, another concept that we really stress in the report is a whole of government approach. Because that whole of government actually starts in education, but that's why I wanted to start with just commenting because I think that we can talk about it and it is really addressed in the report. So a whole of government approach is needed to ensure that the right to health is considered and protected at the highest level. So, and this could serve as a basis for cross ministry collaborations and to establish collective standards, definitions, and priorities really to guide work across all ministries, right? So the system thinking, which we also talk in the report approach, can enable decision makers to break these silos. And again, these silos are starting education, but now we're talking about the practice. So systems thinking aims at identifying how things are connected to each other within a whole entity. So this could be a mechanism to ensuring the health outcomes are always considered across ministries in investment or or disinvestment decisions. And again, systems thinking, whole government approach starts in education. So that's what I would say. Thank you, thank you, Laura. I particularly like how you make it clear that education is not simply graduate education, it actually goes back throughout all our earlier education as well. I, I keep thinking that um, the world will be well served by having a broad-based early education and uh, understanding social factors, how they drive health all the way back to elementary schools worldwide. Um, maybe uh, Jeff, Dr. Sturge, I can direct this one to you. It's from Fui Amevor, um, but I think it actually captures a number of other questions that have been put in the, in the Q&A, but I, I like this very succinct. How do we ensure that senior leaders in organizations are not using data anal and analytics to hear what they want to hear rather than what they and their organizations need to hear? I just think it's a, it's a beautifully worded question. Yeah, <clears throat> and that's a perennial question. Uh, challenge for organizations and, and decision-making bodies. I think the best way to do that, um, and several of my colleagues have already alluded to this, is to have transparent processes for including different stakeholders into decision-making processes. Um, a good example of this, um, I think, comes from the experience that we've seen with the uh, global response to the HIV pandemic over the last 20 years. Um, as a result of the uh, insistence of people living with HIV, and this is the source actually of the, um, the slogan that Nana mentioned a few, uh, few minutes ago, nothing <clears throat> about us without us. As a result of the insistence of people living with HIV, um, decision-making processes at the global, regional, and local levels ensured that people living with HIV and their caregivers and um, others in the community were integrated into the processes by which um, decision makers made decisions at every level. Um, WHO, when it considered clinical practice guidelines for HIV treatment, um, was getting advice from treatment advocates who <clears throat> knew uh, the new treatments as well as the scientists who were developing them. Uh, and who reflected the interests of the community. Um, at the national level, for instance, the uh, Global Fund uh, set up uh, country coordinating mechanisms that included civil society as well as um, the government officials and the, um, the experts, uh, the disciplinary experts uh, from, from different areas. Um, and you can just go down the, uh, the UNAIDS, their governing body included representatives from communities affected it, uh, in different geographies um, <clears throat> and uh, from vulnerable populations. 
so that you could see as the response, the global response to HIV developed over the years, um, decision makers could hardly ignore the input from communities and from people living with the condition. So I think the, the lesson from that um, to respond to the question is that it requires um, vigilance. It requires an openness to involving people uh, with points of view different than those of the people sitting around the table. Uh, and it also requires um, uh, an adaptability, a flexibility, and a willingness on the part of people who feel they have a, a role to play in these kinds of decisions uh, to uh, insist on their inclusion in the process. There's a, a famous anecdote about Shirley Chisholm, who was, um, uh, she represented a, uh, a house district in New York. Uh, she was one of the first black women to run for president in the United States. This goes back uh, some years, so I'm dating myself. Uh, but what she said, uh, what she used to tell her uh, colleagues was, if you don't have a seat at the table, bring a folding chair. <laughs> and so, you know, uh, and that, that's consistent with what I was saying. So I think that's part of the answer. It's obviously a complex question and it's something that one, uh, both people who are involved in decision-making um, uh, in positions of authority in decision-making processes have to be cognizant of this challenge. Uh, and the communities whose decisions are affected need to just uh, continue to advocate for their inclusion in those processes as we've discussed in, in the 3D report. Thank you, Jeff. Let me uh, take build on the, your use of the word adaptability and ask a question um, also from the audience. Maybe Q, I can direct this one to you. And uh, the, um, the question says, how do we build in adaptability, which Jeff just mentioned, that we need, given clearly that our data are imperfect and evolving? And at the same time, as we try to be adaptable and build in adaptability, does that risk undermining our clarity of purpose. So, so what's the balance between adaptability in light of imperfect evolving data and the need for clarity of purpose about what we're trying to do? Yeah, so I, I look, I think in terms of um, the, this pandemic challenging us to get, move from what we traditionally have talked about value-based care to values-based care and, and, and uh, thinking about healthcare and the health system. So to me, um, we shouldn't let perfect be the enemy of the good. We have to leverage data. We have to recognize data as power. And we also have to recognize that data is not perfect, but decisions need to be made um, to allocate resources and to address you know, any crisis or any acute or, or prevent a crisis from happening as some folks have referenced. I do wanna highlight that a lot of this is about also analytics and even artificial intelligence as it's being leveraged more and more for for insights to translate that data. So there's a huge amount of literacy that has to be communicated um, as we talk about adaptability. Um, there's, there's, there's a recognition that we have to teach it earlier, but we also have to teach it in real time. And so um, my point of view on this is that um, part of trust and transparency is telling people that this is the best we know now, but as we learn more, uh, we have to adapt, we have to be agile, and we have to be inclusive of different points of view, as well as different potential new data sets to hopefully improve our ability to predict, personalize, and prevent a bad health outcome. Um, but as is often the case, a decision has to be made. And so this is where the dynamics of vertical versus horizontal relationships are so important. Ultimately, there is someone who's accountable for making key decisions. And to me, being transparent about those decisions often build more trust than being opaque. Thank you. Let me uh, shift gears a little bit. And um, Heidi, maybe I can direct another question to you, something which I know you've written about and thought about, this question about empathy. And I suppose I might broaden it to a full range of other emotional determinants. The question asks, do you think that instilling empathy training for healthcare professionals can play a role in improving health equity? particularly for historically excluded communities. And I might expand that a little bit to ask you about your thoughts about the role of empathy, and I would argue compassion in some of these conversations that we've been having and how these concepts should inform and create the bedrock for really this entire conversation. I think you're on mute, Heidi. Thanks. 
Um, I think empathy is absolutely fundamental. We are in hyper polarized times. And the only way we're going to start to be able to have conversations from the extremes is to have a little empathy. Um, and that's at every level. I think every single one of us from community members up to heads of state um, has to stop for a minute and think about where they can have a bit more empathy. COVID has rocked the world. Everybody has had uh, at some point a bad time. Um, you know, some may be coping differently than others, better, worse. Um, but I think we have a huge opportunity in saying not, did you get your vaccine or did you do this or you should do this, but how are you feeling? Um, to make people feel like you care about more than your piece of data or your particular intervention. So I think empathy comes up in a lot of ways, but I think publics need a bit more empathy too. Um, I think they're pretty hard sometimes and especially in the context of ever-changing data, um, I think, you know, heads of state are in a tough, tough corner. It's not just about the science. It's about economics. It's about a lot of other things. It's about schools. It's about education. It's about keeping their countries, you know, alive in different ways. So I think we need to have a little empathy there. It's much easier to judge. Um, but at the same level, at a community level, I think that you started with the question of healthcare workers. Absolutely. I think we, uh, healthcare professionals need to have a bit of empathy with people's questions. Um, you know, more than ever, it's, you know, there's a lot of uncertain information. I mean, in normal times with routine vaccines, you know, and whatever vaccines or whatever interventions, um, when there's more stable data, we're already getting questions, but I think we should be even more empathetic in times where it's a really complex time for people to make decisions at an individual level. So we need to, I think, um, as, as Kayu is saying, you know, we need to, this is the best we know, and we need to put it out that way and say we're doing the best. I think we also, though, um, there needs to be a bit of empathy with healthcare workers, because right now there's a lot of burnout. There's a lot of people are, are going through a lot. So I think we just need it around, around the table. It, uh, Sandra, can I add a little bit the educational perspective? That's a please do, yes, that, please do. Thank you, that's a great question. And Sandra, and thank you, Katie, too, for your response. But I, I would just add the, the lenses from education and. And you're really right. I think that that's why it's so important to embed all these intangibles, all these competencies, which we call it the human competencies, that more and more our world needs. So if we talk about resiliency, empathy, compassion, those are the skills, those are the competencies that should be embedded. As, the sooner, the, the better. I mean, not in graduate, but again, you know, uh, a lot earlier in educational. But at least if we are in the higher education and we can really uh, embedded all these human competencies in our curriculum. All of these competencies should be and could be developed. And I, I think our world needs a little bit of all of, all of that. So I'm, I'm really uh, you know, excited for the future because I think that if we really uh, revision our curriculums and we do more of the human competencies, you know, our world will be, we're gonna be more prepared and our world will be better. So thank you for that yeah. question. Yeah, thank you both. I, I agree completely. And, and let me just build a little bit on that empathy. And maybe Nana, if I can um, draw you into the conversation, I'm going to uh, build on a question from Dr. Prem Das Pinto from Bangalore. Um, I, I'm going to paraphrase a little bit because I want to build on this empathy idea that uh, Dr. Larson introduced sort of also empathy for decision makers. And the question is, oftentimes data collected from communities may highlight truths that are uncomfortable for decision makers. They might, they might actually cast decision makers in a bad light. And uh, it's one thing to say, well, all the decision makers need to take into account all data and embrace data generated by community. But it's another thing to recognize the lived reality of decision makers. So the question really is, how do we bridge that gap? How, how do we make sure that the idea of data that is comes from the community, characterizes the community, that is hard for decision makers to, to grapple with, to take into account, and how do we how do we bridge that gap and, and uh, create an openness 
for uncomfortable data to the end of actually making better decisions? I know it's a, it's a, it's a super difficult question, but it felt like it built nicely on this empathy for multiple players here. Yeah, it's an excellent question. I mean, I, I think about um, Jim Collins's work on uh, good to, his book, Good to Great, and talks about the brutal facts. Um, one, one, one component of a high performing system, whether it's health or whatever it is, is having data. And those data can be positive or negative or neutral. But the intention of collecting those data is for action. So if, if decision makers are committed to action, are committed to improvement, then even the negative information is a source of learning and perhaps a source of pausing to say, okay, I didn't realize things were this bad and have some humility and then move into action. But if the data are not gonna be used for action and are going to use for judgment and potentially you know, used to punish the, if it's a politician, at the, used to punish the person at the ballot box, and you can understand why people don't want to see some of the negative data. But if you come from a place of action and improvement, then all data are useful, neutral, positive, negative. We need all to be able to make um, holistic decisions that have a, a systems view and potentially can have much more impact on population health and other indicators that we all care about than just um, our, our part of the world. So let me give you an example from uh, my own country, Ghana. Um, and actually it's not just Ghana, there are lots of countries in Sub-Saharan Africa where this phenomenon is common, where people from one sector, let's say education, are building schools. The focus is on primary education, build new schools, and you visit the schools and there are no toilet facilities. And you, you think, how is this possible? But it comes from siloed thinking, right? So the, the education folks are wanting to achieve primary universal education target or secondary school education target, and that's their focus. The architect who designed the space didn't ask tough questions, the builders didn't ask tough questions, and there, there are no toilet facilities. That's unacceptable <laughs> from a health perspective for so many reasons. I don't need to tell this audience about that. But let's think more broadly beyond that. In many countries around the world, physical activity requirements are being reduced in schools uh, because the, there's more emphasis on the uh, reading, writing, and other parts of the curriculum. The people who make those decisions are really well-intentioned. They want the kids to learn. They want the kids to pass the exams and move on to the next level in their education. But with a, with a more systems thinking approach, if we had health people sitting at the table when those decisions are made, the health people could say, you know, physical activity is just as important for a child's growth and development as math, reading, and writing. Maybe we reduce it from three times a week to twice a week, but let's not cancel physical activity altogether. Same thing with school feeding and nutrition. You know, when we think about the school menu, the lunch menu, that's an opportunity. It's, it's not just feeding the children with calories. It's an opportunity for the health people to look at the type of calories, types of calories in that and, you know, whatever is the sugary drinks or whatever it is. So I think, I think we need to, um, we need to create that uh, culture of data for action. We need to bring more people at the table so that multiple lenses can look at the data and multiple lenses can be there for decision making. And then let me end, uh, Sandro, from the empathy perspective by saying that I think we health people um, tend to get a bit self-righteous because we think health is the holy grail. Without health, there's no life. Without life, there's death, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that's true. But we are speaking to the choir. There are lots of people who don't have health prominence day in mind. They only think about health when they are sick and close to dying. Then suddenly they realize, oh yeah, I should have done this, or I shouldn't have done this or whatever. So I think by the same token, when we health people are designing health interventions, we need to invite other sectors to come to the table and influence how we design it. For example, what is the budget effect of the intervention that we're proposing? Let the economists come and do the analysis and tell us, well, actually, if you do it this way, you could probably save a little bit more money here and there. And there's some compromises to be made. You know, let, let the engineers tell us about uh, transportation. The civil engineers can tell us about what the trade-offs are if we do bridges or roads in this way versus that way. So we, also need to come off our pedestal, I think, invite other sectors in when we're designing and really do a give and take. 
let's the more mutually beneficial we can be in different sectors, the more likely we get invited when other interventions are being designed that um, we want health, we want health in all policies. But I think we should, we health people should also invite other sectors to come when we are designing health interventions. It, the, the mutuality can only be beneficial, it allows transparency, allows better quality data or more types of data to be available when decisions are being made. So I'll leave you with that provocation. I know it's tough. I know it sounds like nirvana, but we have to aspire to mutually beneficial. Otherwise we'll continue living in our silos and the health people keep talking to each other and not making progress on health in all policies. No, there are so many things I love about that answer. I could go on and on, but let me just highlight two things. Number one is uh, the, the surfacing the point that um, health is a means, not an end, something which I've written about, which, um, we all is often lost, particularly when you have these kind of conversations, and uh, you attract people who are interested in health, and uh, we forget that health is 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 an aspect towards living a full, rich, flourishing life, and uh, not the end in and of itself. I, I think we cannot surface that enough. So I just want to label that. But then, if I may hone in on the heart of your answer, which was that ultimately one needs to create a a culture of data for action, a culture of data-informed decision-making. And the reason I want, I want to surface that, if I may, is because when one does a report like this, when one engages in a two-year effort like the one we just engaged in, there's often a question that says, well, why are you doing that? And uh, what immediate action emerges from a report like this? And I'm, I'm very resistant to that question because I, I do not think that there is necessarily immediate action. What I actually think we're doing is we are creating a culture, we are contributing towards creating a culture to changing the conversation so that actions are then taking that build on that foundation. One of my favorite um, uh, quotes, which I, uh, I'll paraphrase, is that our job is to generate ideas that are that change how we think so that when the moment is right, we can then take action on them. Now that quote, was actually said by somebody who is an enemy of many in the left and in health, namely Milton Friedman, who was one of the fathers of neoliberal thinking in the United States. And uh, I use that quote both because I like the irony that's coming from Milton Friedman, but actually because I think he was right. And that's what he did, right? He generated a lot of ideas, which then the United States captured the whole movement, arguably not necessarily for the good for health, but, but I actually think that we all can learn from that. Our job is to generate ideas to change the culture so that good can happen. So thank you for surfacing that. I really think that's super important. Um, let me ask um, another question and blessing. Maybe I can draw you back in as um, you're connected. It's, a, it's another tough question. This one's from uh, Dr. Manoj Kumar. And um, uh, Dr. Kumar surfaces something which we haven't discussed, which is that when it comes to decision-making around health, particularly in low, uh, he says in, doctor, in low middle income countries, but I would argue all over the world, there is an uneven playing field often between the private sector and the public sector. In that, he's referring to India where the private sector is particularly powerful and commands resources that the public sector does not. So as a result, we can say all we want about data for decision-making around social determinants, but one sector holds a lot more power than another sector. And that other sector, meaning the public sector, of course, is the sector that typically serves marginalized and vulnerable communities. So the question is, how do we bring balance to that? How do we, how do we reckon with these basic power imbalances? And how do we make sure that decision-making is informed by the needs as, as, as the data give, bears witness to, to the end of improving health for all, not simply those with access to private sector resources? Yeah, thanks, Sandro. I think that's... Uh... That's a very good question, but it's also very interesting because uh, particularly in the low and medium income countries, the income gap, opportunity gap, even service gaps have become very wide and it's getting wider. And uh, you know, it's not only in health, even in education. I mean, private school versus public schools and you see public officials I'm from Nigeria originally. Most of their kids are in Europe and North America, not even in private, don't even talk about private universities within the country that are totally out of the reach of the general public. But I think uh, we, we have emphasized 
this issue that part of the challenge is that the marginalized are actually unseen. They are, they are, their statistics are missing. So one of the things we have emphasized is this issue of spectrum, looking at all the ends, all the points within the, the line, so that if you now highlight what is not there, and I think Nana spoke to that when you asked the question around, the, <clears throat> around data, which public officials don't want to see. Okay, the whole essence is to emphasize what is not, what is neglected. I mean, you, we, we are talking about COVID and so on. Somebody was telling me yesterday about neglected tropical diseases. They are still there, but they are neglected. But until somebody invests in evidence generation to highlight these things, then like I said initially, if you don't, if you are not able to measure it, then it becomes even difficult to articulate it in policy, talk less about uh, articulating it in implementation. However, I think it's important to go back to the decision making sub, sub uh, working group and the things they have already said. It is obvious that those who control uh, political power, I mean, they control the destiny of the nation. They have monopoly of instruments of coercive action. They make policies, they implement them, and they have control of the budget. So we need to keep knocking at that door. I think it is that there's a scripture that says, uh, seek and you will find knock and the door will be open. So there is no other alternative but to knock, to find ways to continue to generate up to date robust evidence and bring this evidence to where decisions are made through all kinds of means. And uh, just to you know, tie that up, uh, sometimes it's also important. I was giving the example of population growth rates where how it's different parts of the world. Some are growing, some are zero growth, but some are declining. And it, those population trajectories has different implications for the age structure and therefore the health challenges. But let me even go to housing, which is where we focus in our report on social determinants. I mean, housing is relevant across different countries. In our report, we had Singapore, United Kingdom, and Kenya. Housing as a social determinant is real in these places, but the needs are different, okay? And I, I had somebody, I, I can't remember, who was trying to make a distinction between equity and equality. That when we talk about equity, it is actually meeting people at their points of need. So which has also means that those in developed countries and those who are privileged classes, may also have their own level of need. And if you look at housing, in many low and middle income countries, you are talking about basic provision, access to housing. You are talking about just basic quality of housing. But if you look at high income countries like Singapore, United Kingdom, you are talking about uh, greener houses. You are talking about energy efficiency. You are talking about how do you adapt to environmental changes in terms of new housing materials. So in essence, there is need for us to look at the entire spectrum and make sure we have evidence for everyone and then bring it to where decisions are made. I don't think there is an alternative. We can't carry placards on the road. We have to bring evidence to where decisions are made and those who control political power, they have the, that capacity to do so. But how do we approach them? not only through supply of evidence, but how do we also make them to demand evidence? And I think that is where I want to end, where issue around co-creation of knowledge, ownership of the evidence, participatory approaches, you know, intersectoral and even transdisciplinary collaborations should then become part of the models we need to employ. It's like pulling all the arsenals in our armory. Thank you. Thank you, Basing. Um, this, is, this conversation could go on for hours, but I, I won't keep us going for hours. I just want to ask one last question. Maybe we're going to go around the panel. I'll go back in the same order we started with one last question to end us with. And I was wondering if I can ask each panelist to reflect briefly on what do you think is the, the key challenge in moving the Commission's agenda forward? And also, what do you think is the key opportunity that we have to actually move the conversation in line with the commission agenda. Heidi, maybe I'll start with you. Hold on, you're mute, Heidi. 
I said you didn't give me much time to think there. Um, <laughs> sorry, sorry. No, that's the danger of being that's first. Okay. <laughs> that's okay. You started with me that way, so <laughs> I should learn by now. Um, I, um, I think the key challenge is we have, I think, a tremendous amount of great uh, principles, um, thoughts, even specifics here, but it's really to get this, um, get all of this thinking and, and learning internalized. Um, and I think the best way to do that is really by, by example, we need to maybe take on one challenge, take on one issue, or take on three different types of, of challenges where we can demonstrate what does this mean in a, in a real life situation. Um, so I think really, in, in, if I had to say in one word, it's internalizing it. Thank you. I really like it. That, that, that dovetails nicely with some of our other conversation. Uh, Q. Yeah, I, I'd love this discussion and, and the questions. So as I'm reflecting, um, I do think um, of things that connect people together. We often talk about what divides us, um, the public sector, the private sector, um, power dynamics. Um, and so as I was reflecting just most recently, I was thinking about the role that data has played it, throughout my career, moving from a, a physician who took care of one patient at a time to now thinking broader of one population at a time. And so there's a term that kind of resonated as we were talking about empathy, it's like teaching data empathy, realizing that so much of what we're talking about is, um, is of course, it's partly about the data, but it is about um, the stories and the statistics. And so a program like Ryan White wouldn't have happened for HIV AIDS without Ryan White. And so I think um, bringing humanity to the data and teaching data empathy is going to be important and, and recognizing how we have so much more in common than we have different. Thank you, Q. Blessing. Thank you. Thank you, Sandro. I, if you ask me, I would tell you, I think it is knowledge translation policy engagement and developing knowledge products to reach policy makers. Like where I stopped before, that is where the box stops there. That is where decisions are made. I mean, you can have all the non-governmental organizations do the things they do, but those whose policies affect the nation and reach the entire population, who has the, made the real budget for the nation and communities are those in power. So how do we, knowledge translation, if you ask me, like I said, policy engagement, knowledge products to reach groups like that, regional launchings, and uh, those things require a lot of funding. Sandro, and maybe I have this opportunity here because what we see is that funding circles, you know, there's always time frame. okay? This program, this uh, commission's work is for two years. And within that two years, you can see the enormity of evidence that has been generated. But maybe we need another two years of consistent effort to now get this evidence in the where it can be digestible and to the hands that need them. And that requires another level of investment. So most of the time, and you already, we all agree that policy making is not, a, is not instant coffee. It, it, there is a lot of processes that go there. And most of the time we are looking for outcomes. They don't just happen, it's not, there's no magic wand. So it requires some series of engagement, which is a totally different kind of uh, investment and interaction. So I think if you ask me, that is where the, the march should shift. It should shift on how do we move this, this great evidence into the hands of policymakers at international, national, and regional levels. So that's what I think. And I think we need a different kind of funding stream. We are in research here. And most of the time in three, four years, the research grant ends. And if you want to sustain your institution, you have to move chase for another research grant. And we've really seen very little effort or very little investment in, in knowledge translation, policy engagement, and communication. I think that is one critical area, if you ask me, 
we need to begin to think about in the next couple of years. Thank you. Thank you, Blessing. Laura. Yeah, thank you, Sandro. Well, I think that the, the report came in the right time for the academic public health community nationally and globally, because exactly right now is where we are really thinking about the future. We're thinking about framing the future 2030. What are the skills? What are the competence? What are the knowledge? What are the, what are the gaps uh, of, the, of the workforce? So this is exactly the right moment where we're gonna just revisit the whole report in terms of what the suggestions are in terms of the topics. But the topics, yes, the knowledge, but also some of the human qualities that, that Haiti and, and, and you and, and the others were talking about that really our workforce needs in order to embed in the curriculum for the future. So in that, for the academic public health community globally, I think it's the right time to just discuss all the content of the, of the report. So thank you. And I hope to see all of those concepts and linkages with our partners nationally and globally. Thank you, Lara. Um, uh, Jeff. Uh, thanks. <clears throat> thanks, Sandra. I'd like to um, use a metaphor to, uh, to respond to the question you asked about challenges and opportunities. Um, and, uh, and it builds on what Blessing and Laura were just saying. You know, we've talked, or I talked earlier in my uh, first intervention about finding a common language for policy change so that we could uh, do a better job of uh, taking the insights from data and determinants and turning them into better decisions in public health policy. And we also spoke about translation, both in terms of translating data into knowledge, of translating that knowledge into different uh, policy um, prescriptions. So if we just think about common language and translation for a moment as, as the metaphor, well, what you need are people who can live in two different cultures to be able to translate from one culture to the other. Uh, and so I think there are interesting opportunities. Um, uh, well, first of all, the challenge is that people tend to live in silos and work in silos. And that's something that we've talked about throughout this, um, this event. Uh, but the opportunity is to find ways to um, identify people who can translate between these different communities of practice uh, or different ways of working and looking at the world. Um, and there's a particular role for schools of public health there because um, if the curriculum begins to uh, emphasize both data and determinants uh, and the way in which those can lead to better decision-making, then you can begin to generate graduates who have that, um, uh, that uh, perspective um, sort of internalized as Heidi suggested uh, that that's been inculcated in them. And as they go out into the world and the various roles that they'll have, they'll think about decision-making for health in a different way. And also we can bring policymakers into the academy. So, uh, and I'm sure many of the schools in Laura's organization and Sandra, you may do this at BU, but you know, bring in policymakers for a year or two um, or find ways to engage students and faculty with real live policymakers uh, to really show people um, through uh, specific applications and engagement, how these perspectives can lead to better policies. And I think over time uh, that will move in the direction that Blessing was talking about where we need that kind of knowledge translation and policy engagement. Uh, and I think it, actively um, taking advantage of those opportunities will move us toward the kinds of actions we would like to see. Over. Thank you, Jeff. No, no, you get the last word. Okay, thank you. Um, so let me start with the challenge and end with the opportunity. I think one of our biggest challenges in this space is that the duration of time needed to measure the impact of any investments in some of the social determinants of health is quite long for many of them. Um, and so it can be more difficult to make the case for policymakers, especially those who have a, a, a political appointees whose time in office might be limited. If it takes 10 years or even a generation to see the effect of you know, perhaps universal primary education, universal secondary school education or some housing investment, I think it's harder to convince people who have to make decisions in the here and now that the benefits of the decisions will not be seen for a couple of decades. So that's one thing that we need to, and, address in our conversations with uh, entities from different sectors and with the decision makers who control the budgets. 
the opportunity that I see is that you know we have the given everything going on in the world right now with COVID and even prior to COVID, we have the opportunity to reframe investments in social determinants of health as more as a, an investment in health, which saves us money that we would otherwise be spending on health care, especially expensive health care. In some countries, I believe in the US, you know, 50% of healthcare expenditures are in the last year of life. And 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 it, and those expenditures don't necessarily improve quality of life. They're just you know hail mary desperate interventions to keep somebody alive in the last few months of a, a terminal illness. So if it's the same budget, if this if it's the same budget owner that we're talking to about investing in social determinants of health to an, enable people to lead a healthy life, healthy aging, so they can die quote unquote from natural causes and not end up with multiple chronic diseases that are very expensive to treat, then we have the opportunity to, to reframe health as an investment rather than health as an expenditure. But it, it will take some work. It will take some work. Right now, we see it with the um, high-risk conditions that make people more likely to engage in the healthcare system, especially tertiary care at later stages of their lives. We see all the comorbidities that make people at a higher risk of severe COVID illness, hospitalization, ICU, et cetera. This is an opportunity to think about the upstream determinants of good health, good aging, healthy aging, and healthy dying, so that we avoid those you know, very, very expensive uh, curative, curative uh, services that may or may not have an impact on quality of life or any extension of longevity. So let me leave you with that uh, opportunity, opportunity that I think we all have to embrace as we speak to others across multiple sectors. Well, I think um, opportunity is a wonderful place to end. Thank you, Nana. Uh, I um, want to extend my sincerest gratitude to all the panelists for a really interesting conversation and to the audiences who, do, who joined us at this uh, UNGA event. Uh, my only regrets that we're not there in person, but uh, we are all learning to. Um, a Zoom world, but I much also look forward to reconnecting in person uh, for events like this. I also would like to thank all the commissioners. This, uh, the audience has met six of the commissioners, but I want to uh, thank all 24 commissioners, as well as the, um, as the secretariat um, at Raven Martin and the uh, core team at Boston University who really made the work of the commission possible. And I want to thank Rockefeller Foundation who had the vision to um, launch this work. As I think emerged from this conversation, work like this doesn't end anything. If, if I think if work like this done right, it uh, it starts things. It doesn't end anything. What we're actually doing here is we are generating ideas, seeding ideas that aim to shift culture and uh, to aim to shift how we think to, to bring us to a place where thinking of data around social determinants as being intrinsically linked to decision making becomes second nature, where we no longer even have to think about it. And that's going to take a while. That will take years and decades to achieve that. But a work like this really aims, to my mind, to be a step in the direction. Not a first step, there've been other steps, but a step, hopefully, a um, one that is impactful in that direction. A couple of things to note, as people have put this in the chat, uh, we are doing um, a set of regional launches that are um, anchored to regional institutions, really as part of our effort to continue changing the culture, continuing to seeding this, uh, these thoughts into a broader agenda to push forward thinking about the three Ds agenda, the principles and recommendations from the report. And over the next year, we'll be working on, on fully more fully realizing the website to put tools and resources available, both for scholars, but also for community members and for decision makers. Again, as part of shifting how we think about this, how we think about the 3D agenda and making the 3D agenda something that is part of the common conversation decision-making. With that in mind, thank you. Thank you to everybody. Thank you to everybody in the global community who thinks about these things, who really is working on creating better decision-making to make better health. Everybody have a good evening, good afternoon, and good morning. Thank you to all. Thanks.